Glory to Jesus Christ. Welcome to the Orthodox Ethos YouTube channel, and thank you for visiting or being a subscriber. The interview you're about to watch took place at the inaugural conference of the Uncut Mountain Press and is a part of a larger offering of tremendous material by leading Orthodox speakers, clergymen, writers, publishers. We want to encourage you to take advantage of the entire offering over at orthodoxethos.com. Go over there and register, take part in the forum, take advantage of the blog and the reading list and the entire video library, live streaming, PDF, all of the material that's there in addition to all of the lectures from the conference. You won't regret it. This is just one part of a larger treasure of material that will edify and strengthen and inspire you. God bless. Dr. Davis, we're thrilled to have you with us here at the Uncommon Mountain Press Conference and to have you uh, present the book, which was well received. We sold out, I don't know if you knew that, we sold out all of your copies oh, very here. Very good. And it's selling wonderfully. It's uh, uh, for the, those who are not familiar with it, Antichrist, the fulfillment of globalization, uh, the ancient church. How does it go, the sub subtitle? Uh, the Ancient Church and the End of History. And the End of History. What a fantastic title and what a fantastic book. We've gotten great reviews. It's selling very well. Uh, and I think it's going to help a lot of people. It seems like the, the feedback I'm getting is that people are saying, it woke me up. It, it really made me understand where we are in this process. And I think that's a tremendous service to people, not only intellectually, but spiritually. You know, if, if, if you can, if a book can put us in a state of watchfulness, it's a great book because that's, that's what's really necessary today. We're getting, we're getting uh, lulled to sleep or we're getting frightened into, uh, you know, uh, apathy or, or crawling back into our hole or whatever it is. Uh, and so we need to be encouraged because your book also encourages people. Look, this is the truth of things. We know this already. It's been foretold. Don't fear, you know, in a lot of ways. Yes. I, I mean, I hope that's the sort of the ultimate message uh, of the book. Um, I mean, it's what the Lord himself tells us that, in the world we will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Yes, yes. And that applies not only in his time when he walked the earth, but it applies now. Uh, and it applies to especially his church, the Orthodox Church. Um, and so while within globalization there can be many large and frightening even events wars and rumors of wars, economic upheavals, uh, nations collapsing and recoalescing. Um, in a sense, this is all part of God's plan for humanity, uh, not because he desires bad things for us, right. but because he ultimately desires good things. He desires us to cling to him and not to the uh, man-made institutions of the world which are all, uh, however well intended, temporary. Yes. Well, there's the as this as they say in the patristic writings, there's the kat uh, evdokian thelima, the the express will or the good will of God, which He desires, which is the salvation of all mankind, the creation of the world. And then there's the kataparachoresi, uh, which is the what He allows. Yes. Uh, and because of our free will and where things go, He's always trying to correct course and bring everyone uh, back to himself. And I think that's what you mean, that the plan of God is in the midst of this chaos created by sin and the devil. He's working out our salvation with sometimes very difficult trials, but salvific. Yes. And, and really, again, when we look to globalization, which generally understood is a secular phenomenon, it's not only secular, as I try and show, but we approach it as a secular phenomenon, it's only properly understood from the perspective of eternity. Absolutely. Um, 
because any, any theory of history that we might want to develop is going to suffer from being part of the very history it's trying to explain. It's a logical self-referential problem that's plagued theories of history throughout history. Mm. Um, and so we have to look to a perspective outside of time. Uh, but we can't get that simply speculating on our own because we are stuck in time. We must look to eternity. And eternity mm. is made manifest to us in the church. Mm. Um, as the uh, political scientist Eric Vogelin put it, the church is the flash of eternity into time. Mm. Uh, and though Vogelin wasn't an Orthodox Christian, um, he understood the explanatory power of uh, the Orthodox Church and of its understanding of history and of man's place in it. Mm -hmm. Brother Zephyr Mills, would like, if I remember correctly, would like to say often that we know the Alpha and the Omega of history, and you must know it if you're going to understand everything in between. And I think yes. that your book is an attempt to say what's going on here on the basis of our knowledge of the beginning and end of all things. This is, this is where, since we know where it's going to end up, let's dial back and let's see the process here. We know, because that's the key, right? If you don't know where, where the end is, you can't make sense of where, what we're doing, what's going on in the world. That's right. And because history continues into the unknown future, um, we're at sea if we just fall back on our own resources. Yes. That's why we have to look to the church uh, and her teachings about the end, and in particular about this man who will come to rule the world, um, who is the Antichrist. Mm. And he comes in place of Jesus Christ. He is fundamentally a fraud. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people sort of imagine Antichrist maybe as a great tyrant or a warmonger, and it's possible that he may have some of those attributes, but he will come really in the capacity of goodness and justice and even meekness, mm -hmm. and thus luring the world into giving him supreme power. And so many heterodox Christians unfortunately, uh, are under the delusion that Christ will come again within the ranks of human society, mm. the way he did before. The Orthodox Church has always considered that to be a heresy. Mm. Chiliasm. Um, Chiliasm, yes, chiliasm. exactly. That Christ will rule for a, supposedly a thousand years on earth. That thousand years is figuratively speaking now, the reign of the church on earth. Yes. Um, but they apply it to the future incorrectly. Um, and therefore, Antichrist will draw in these heterodox Christians, and he will also fulfill many of the prophecies of Judaism as the awaited Judaic Messiah. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, there will be an alliance uh, of many Jews and heterodox Christians. It's already happening. It's already happening. Uh, we sometimes call it Judeo-Christianity. Mm -hmm. um, that will support Antichrist um, ultimately uh, as reigning from the temple, the rebuilt temple, the old Hebrew temple in Jerusalem. Which it, there's reports off and on. I'm not sure how I, uh, I can't verify them, but I hear them through the grapevine that there, there is a group of very zealous uh, I guess ox, uh, Orthodox Jews, or I don't know what, but they're preparing that for that day. They're they're they're, uh, they're doing whatever they need to do to have uh, things in order so they can uh, offer the sacrifice and all the rest. Have you heard such things? Before? I've heard such things, yes. And and I and I think the the essence of uh, Orthodox Judaism is doing good works uh, according to their lights to bring about the coming of the Messiah. That's really the end. Hmm. Uh, but also I, I have heard, again, I can't uh, you know, be certain, uh, but that the temple itself has already been rebuilt and is in a warehouse somewhere yes. all set to go. Yes, yes, yes. Beyond the speculations though, the, your book focuses on the aspect of the, the, one of the keys and the signs, I guess, is globalization, correct? Yes. 
And why is globalism so important to the scent of Antichrist? Well, Antichrist will rule a unified world civilization. Uh, maybe there will be some parts of the world that won't accept his rule, but generally speaking, there will be a one world order at which he will be the head. And therefore, the process of globalization, which is a process of concentration and consolidation, pulling together all the elements of the world, both politically, economically, mm -hmm. and otherwise, that is the logical precursor to the advent of this man. Mm. So does that mean we're very close or very far or just it's an important uh, stop on the way? Um, we're getting there. Yeah. Uh, I see globalization as a process. It continues. Uh, the pendulum may swing back. Uh, I'm not a historical determinist, um, but ultimately the process will find fulfillment, and the church tells us how. Well, Western history is just a, a pendulum swing in, since the schism. Would you, would you agree with that? Yes, I would say that since, since the schism of the 11th century, when Rome uh, went her own way, um, to me that's really the defining moment in the history of Western civilization. We tend to think of Western civilization as Greco or Roman, but really it was the Eastern Roman Empire that maintained continuity uh, with Greco-Roman forms uh, and really maintained, of course, Orthodox Christianity. Uh, and Rome became a self-understood monarchy, uh, both spiritual and temporal. Um, and it was that deviation from Orthodoxy that set up really a thousand years of heresy. And the Western world, uh, I would say, is really fundamentally heretical. It's based on the idea that we can build a paradisal realm on earth. The utopian schemes with the, uh, come to mind of the Protestant Reformation. That yes. We had some, some strange and uh, just bizarre uh, attempts at, at perfecting the society in the, in the early days of the Reformation. That would, be, would that be the beginning of the utopianism that's now, seems like it's what you're describing, but the Antichrist seems like a, an attempt, a final attempt of, uh, of a utopia. Yes, Earth. the Antichrist, I would say, would be the final attempt. But I would say even in the idea of papal infallibility, which started in the 11th century, even though it wasn't codified till the 19th century, um, that idea, that utopian idea is there that, look, hey, the Pope has a special gift uh, that makes him infallible. Uh, and he, he therefore can dictate um, effectively a utopian society on earth, or at least within the realms of Rome. Um, it's not how it worked out. It's not how it worked out in the Reformation. Mm -hmm. It's not worked how it worked out in the French Revolution. And it's not working well today with Francis either. Uh, no, no. <laughs> I don't think a lot of Roman, I think a lot of those who follow Catholicism would say we've got problems. Uh, no, no utopia here today, in terms of no, Francis. No, def definitely not. Yeah. So, so that that concept it's still hanging around, um, but it, but but like all claims to infallibility, whether it's the Pope or whether it's the Communist Party, uh, which claims infallibility because it's in the vanguard of history. Uh, ultimately, they all come to naught. So, uh, would you say that, um, in that sense, is it, or rather, is it in that sense that that people say the Pope is a forerunner to Antichrist? That he claimed infallibility and a kind of a monarch on, uh, on the earth in both the temporal and spiritual? Is that what makes him seen as a forerunner? Yes, I think so. Uh, I think that is a a legitimate. Um, term to apply to the papacy. I mean, there have been maybe some good popes and some bad popes, but um, the whole idea of infallibility, of course, is anathema to orthodoxy, um, but it certainly will be, be fulfilled by Antichrist. Of a man, an infallibility of a man. An infallible we, man. We would say there's infallibility in the church as yes. a whole. Yes, yes. That, that would be, meaning the Holy Spirit. Right. Meaning the whole body of Christ together is one. Yeah. You're right. When God operates through his church, 
Yes. We are infallible. Yes. But only, but only then, if any, if any man, any, any patriarch or anybody um, goes off on their own, then they lose. Yes. They lose that. Yes. So would you say that your book spends more, the most time looking at the political, economic, uh, attempting to show that globalism is a part of the ascent of Antichrist and from those perspectives, or is it pretty much one third of each economic, political, and religious? You kind of divide it up. How, how does it work in, in the book? Uh, well, I start out arguing for the perspective of the church when we approach history. Okay. Um, and the church tells us how history ends with oh, that's Antichrist. Key. That's key. So that's key. That's sort of the point of departure. Yes. Uh, and then I do discuss a fair amount of history, how we have come to where we are now. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yes, I divide um, globalization basically for convenience onto three topics, economics, politics, and religion. Um, and that, that third one, um, I think, is probably less well understood in the secular world, mm. maybe for obvious reasons, but we in orthodoxy are very sensitive, or should be very sensitive, to the efforts to pull all religions together mm. um, that can then be crowned by this man who will come not only as a king, but also as a high priest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, would you say that um, uh, we need to be watchful and uh, across the board, the political ski, uh, uh, spectrum? In other words, are there Antichrist and the spirit of Antichrist on the far right, the middle and the far left? Or is it just one part of the political spectrum that really is dominated by the spirit of Antichrist? Well, I think historically, uh, in the modern era, um, the greater threats have been from the left. Okay. The revolutionary left. You look to communism, for example. Sure. Even, even Nazism, we need to be clear, was National Socialism, uh, which was really a revolutionary movement. It was not in, in any way conservative. Um, so the danger may come from there, or indeed the danger may be a counterpoint to a revolutionary threat on the left. Um, so it's, I, I think that... Is, let me ask a, 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 mm. another question then. Is there anything that's not of the revolution today politically, meaning post-enlightenment, American Revolution, French Revolution, Russian Revolution, seems to be across the board, monarchy has been replaced. Yes, that's true. Um, I think that the one holdout, or maybe two holdouts, uh, the first could be considered Russia as the last remaining orthodox great power. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the reasons that the West is so eager to destroy her. We're sort of seeing that now. Uh, the other holdout, in a way, uh, is China. Uh, China has never gone through a Christian phase, um, so it's sort of hard to understand how it would work into uh, an anti-Christian uh, world civilization. Um, and I'm no expert on China. Mm. It does seem that China, uh, in terms of the social credit system and things like that, is in step with the West in globalization, on that, on that level at least. Yes, I think so. I mean, I think China, China is looking out for number one, um, but certainly a lot of what they're doing, like the social credit system, the central bank digital currency that they've recently brought out, um, are all elements um, that um, I think the West will adopt or try to adopt um, in a more totalitarian way. Mm. Um, Are there warring factions in, in your reading uh, between, let's say, the globalists slash Freemasons of the West and the globalists and the Freemasons of the East? I've heard people say that there's a, 
there, there's warring factions in the East. They war against those in the West. There's not, I mean, it would make sense to me that it would not be a perfect unity among all these uh, Antichrist right. forces. Right. Right. They're all vying for the, the top of the pile, right? They're, they're, they're all uh, ambitious. Uh, is that, would that be accurate? I think so. Uh, but again, I come back to what the church tells us about this man um, that the fathers tell us that again, he will come in the capacity of the Judaic Messiah, mm -hmm. and he will come in the capacity of Christ come again, fraudulently. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, in a sense, is his power base. Mm. Um, others may support him, maybe he, he will have to defeat um, other factions. Uh, it also seems clear that his power base will likely be the nations of the old Roman Empire the Euro-Mediterranean mm -hmm. basin, mm -hmm. uh, even though ultimately um, he will have his uh, temple built for him in Jerusalem. And the same temple that the Jews will worship in. That's correct. So does this mean that we, 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 there exists in the various religions a, a desire for a Messiah or expectations of a Messiah that they will then see this Antichrist as something that they've been expecting, not just Christianity and Judaism? Well, I, I th many people have argued that. Um, uh, it's a little less clear to me. I think you could certainly make the case with Islam. I, I, uh, I've heard that the Islam is expecting the return of Christ? Uh, well, they are. A Christ figure in Jerusalem? The uh, Mahdi um, is, is one name, um, but they do regard Jesus technically as the Messiah. Yes. Um, now, what, the question is, well, what does that mean to them? They don't, uh, I mean, they don't that, believe he's divine and human, so, right. so he, he must be dead to, for them. That's correct, but will, you know, does it mean he's, he's resurrected and comes back? Um, it, I, I, I also am not um, as uh, up to speed on Islam as I might be, or used to be even, um, but, he, but indeed Antichrist could fulfill um, the longings of other peoples and other religions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and that's, again, part of his great deception. That would seem to make sense if he's going to be a global figure on a religious level. He must have, uh, he, must have he will have command of the uh, hopes and dreams of, of religious people throughout the world. Yes, seems. yes. Well, this is fascinating. We could go on for a long time, but I think people need to read the book. And uh, they are. And that's what's great. Uh, we're very excited. It was a long time coming. You had a long time to write it, <laughs> a long time to wait for it to be published. But thanks be to God, Glory it's to out, God. it's circulating, it's helping people. And we're grateful to God for your, your, your patience and perseverance. Well, thank you, Father, for publishing it. Glory be to Jesus Christ. <laughs> Oh,